Hello to everyone. I'm truly pleased to be here in Limassol for this uh, moderation. It's always a pleasure and an honor to join Limassol uh, shipping community. And uh, this very first uh, maritime uh, marine insurance conference uh, clearly uh, has an added value. Uh, it gives food for thought, and I'm more than glad to contribute to this. Being a half academic and half practitioner, please allow me to commence this uh, moderation with, um, first of all, with uh, a story and with a fact from history, a historical fact. Before I go on, however, I would like to ask uh, our panelists to join me. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Andreas Andreu, Columbia Ship Management Company. And then, Ian Clerk West. Would you be so kind to join me, please? And of course, we are going to have uh, some questions for the, um, in relation to the presentation by Fred Kenny. So, uh, Fred, uh, would you be kind enough to sit here next to me? Uh, so promises must be kept, and let me start with a historical fact, and then the tale. We all like stories, don't we? Well, uh, Megarian decree, 5th century BC, the Athenians ban uh, Megarians, the residents of um, the city of Megara, from uh, selling their products on the Athenian markets. That was the first sanctions that we had in history, 5th century BC. And uh, this is interesting because, indeed, history repeats itself. And as the gentleman, uh, our platinum sponsor, had said, uh, we should always expect the unexpected. So history repeats itself, but how ready are we? to deal with the unexpected. And now, the tale. I think that it is accurate to say that sanctions, uh, due diligence, the logistics of, of sanctions in general, are somewhat under uh, the sort of Damocles. Because there is a certain anxiety and uncertainty surrounding these very important matters. Now, for distant memories, if you are not uh, or if you are not familiar with the tale, Damocles um, was envious of his king, of his achievements, his luxurious environment, etc. And he had the chance one day, just for one day, to sit at the king's table and see how the king was living his uh, enviable life. But all of a sudden, he realized that above his head there was a sword, Damoclius Pathy, a sword that was hanging uh, just uh, from, it, from a single uh, hair of a horse's tail. And when he realized so, he somewhat, somewhat uh, comments to understand, this is a tale as we said, uh, the risks, this is the key word I think, which is reflective of today's uh, conference, he realized the risks that accompany each achievement, including uh, successful achievements like uh, successful business projects. Project. So, um, without further uh, delay, I would like, and against this uh, background, um, I'm, once again, I'm more than happy to moderate this uh, panel, and I hope we will be able to draw uh, some interesting useful uh, conclusions um, towards the end of this interaction. Um, Fred, uh, I would like to ask you, please, I had in mind actually to ask you um, some, a question about the extension and um, the challenges relating to inspections. I think you have addressed both issues during your presentation. And um, I would be interested, because you have used the words lessons learned 
a couple of times during your presentation. Uh, I would be interested in asking you to elaborate on this aspect. Any lessons learned from um, the whole uh, undertaking? Sure. Well, I think there were a lot of them. Uh, I think some of the, the initial assumptions that we had going in uh, to the negotiations um, were somewhat washed away. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the biggest threats that we saw uh, going into the negotiations was the mine threat. Uh, because, as you know, there were some merchant vessels that did hit mines in the early days of the war, and we, we thought that was really going to be an issue. We were making plans to have areas demined and that sort of thing, which was going to be a very difficult international effort. Um, but it turned out not to be a problem. In fact, uh, there's only been one incident, and that was uh, a, a merchant vessel participating in and tra transiting in the corridor saw a mine ahead of them. They were able to stop in time. They didn't hit it. The Ukrainians came out and neutralized it, so the, and that was last October. But really, so far, in terms of security incidents, the, the Maritime Humanitarian Corridor and the initiative has been really incident-free. So what we thought was going to be a problem turned out not to be a problem. Uh, I think uh, this was a unique situation where you had two countries that were actively at war with each other, uh, trying to do something on a, on a humanitarian level, and that, doesn't, that hasn't happened many times in history. So mm -hmm. the negotiating dynamics, I think a, a lot of us were, were uh, you know, feeling our way in the dark a little bit as to how the negotiations should work, but as I said, uh, I found the best success we had was keeping them technical and practical. Because in the end, this is a practical uh, was a is a practical operational uh, negotiation, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons we're, it was able to be successful. Is we we by and large kept the politics out of it. Mm -hmm. And at some stage, you had mentioned that by keeping the technical part from the political part uh, uh, separate areas, uh, separate approaches, you had somewhat uh, facilitated, uh, the whole process yes. was uh, after all facilitated. Absolutely. Um, uh, from the humanitarian corridor back to sec sanctions, I would like to ask you, uh, Andreas, uh, Andreu, Columbia Ship Management, um, we all understand uh, that we are within a volatile uh, context and we have seen, uh, as it was also mentioned during the conference, underwriter, underwriters pulling out. Um, how have you experienced this um, uh, in the industry uh, and uh, more specifically in the context where you have been operating? Thanks, Siliana, for the question. Before answering, I would like to thank uh, Anna and Adonis for inviting me as well to participate in this conference. Yeah, it is important to, to know that uh, the way sanctions rules have been drafted, uh, rendered insurers, bankers and other service providers uh, as the policemen, if I could say so, uh, of, and enforcement uh, authorities of uh, the various uh, governments uh, by uh, exposing them uh, themselves uh, to penalties if they are found to be dealing with sanctioned vessels or sanctionable activities. So um, a, a number of them, yes, may have uh, taken uh, the very safe route to uh, abandon insuring mm -hmm. ships that are related to Russia, not just calling Russia, but in general are related to Russia. However, from our experience, our underwriters and clubs, and some of them are here, have taken prudent and uh, measured steps so that uh, they protect, first of all, themselves, but also to keep servicing their clients and members. So, as far as we are concerned, we haven't seen in our arrangements, mm -hmm. any underwriter pulling out of cover uh, the ships that we manage. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ian, Claire, can you say that our perception of war risks has changed? Um, how have uh, uh, 
uh, war risks and how insurers cope with the situation? Uh, I, I speak from the perspective of being a P&I insurer, and, uh, and while at the moment we now offer war and, uh, and uh, hull insurance products that we didn't at the time. So uh, I can look at this really from the FD and deep pipe type of perspective, which mm -hmm. I think was something that Harris Papas Bouropoulos mentioned earlier on as well, about the relationship side, uh, whether you will look at providing support for a member who is having a, perhaps a, an engaging with their, uh, their war risk insurers as to how they may be able to progress the discussion for uh, the CTL, the, uh, the declarations that need to be made, and, and the responses that came from the war risk insurers. And, uh, and we saw that in a variety of contexts. And, uh, and of course, the first thing that any insurance company would do is look at the scenario, the situation, and see whether it actually fell within the concept of being a CTL after the 24th of February. And I think generally that became an acceptance that the, uh, the situation was uh, indeed uh, one that could give rise to a, a CTL. Now, the next question, of course, that then arose for uh, for the ship owners who were who were stuck in uh, in Ukraine is that what 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 could actually happen on this declaration of a CTL? You know, was it going to be a case that they would be paid out, um, and then, or who would then take the title to the uh, to the vessel? You know, insurance companies. Uh, insurance companies. We don't really like to run ships uh, per se, and I, I'm not a war risk insurer. But mm -hmm. you know, generally, we would not want to be running ships as insurers. That's down to people who are ship owners, um, and they do a much better job of that. So, um, you know, difficult questions could arise. You know, what about the types of insurances that may need to be put in place? What about the crewing of vessels? Um, you know, if the vessel was then uh, paid out as a CTL, but the, uh, the notice of abandonment was not accepted by the war risk insurers. You know, the owner of the ship would still be the owner of the ship. What would they need to account back to uh, for those war risk insurers in due course, for example, if they sold the vessel? Um, or were they to uh, literally just retain the title to the ship, uh, but they would still have obligations to man it, make sure it's got insurance, things could happen to that vessel. You know, there are a whole mass of different issues that would need to come into play for either the war risk insurers or indeed for the, uh, for the ship owner. Mm -hmm. And um, returning to um, the industry's perspective, Andreas, how, how have you experienced compliance uh, checks? And uh, have there been any cases where you had a different uh, perception of uh, risks than the perception brought forward uh, by uh, 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 the stakeholders uh, inquiring to compliance? Again, uh, just uh, for reference, each entity in the chain uh, has to carry out their own sanctions checks. One cannot delegate the checks to somebody Absolutely. else. The same goes for us and our clients. Um, and, of course, our underwriters. The, the problem with compliance and sanctions checks is, uh, as Lucas mentioned earlier today, the variety of forms that go around in the industry. We may have persuaded a, a few of our underwriters to use, or accept actually, not use, uh, our sanctions checks, uh, which uh, basically are quite thorough and detailed. Uh, however, we have others who have created their own and insist on us using their own uh, checklists. Uh, this has added a lot of burden uh, on the administration side. And possibly one can demonstrate uh, how we handle this and how much administration work uh, is imposed on a sanctions team in a company which manages so many ships especially a number of them calling at Russian ports, uh, will, will show the extent of what we talk about. So um, just a scenario, uh, a ship owner informs us that a, a tanker will call um, a Russian port in the Black Sea to carry out STS operation. Unfortunately, the information comes quite late in in the operation. Usually we tell our clients we need at least two full working days to carry out checks because it's not only our checks, but of course the underwriters will carry out their own checks once we mm -hmm. provide the information. So uh, if we are informed last minute, we are forced first of all to 
stop the operation uh, until the checks are done and the green light can be given. Uh, in this particular instance, because we don't talk only about sanctions, but also breach of war areas, one has to be very careful where the ship will stop, mm -hmm. because the, the areas that are covered by the sanctions regimes are not the same as the breach areas. So you cannot stop a ship within a breach area because then AP will start counting. So that, that's the first step. Then uh, the client has to complete the checklist. And it's not only uh, a checklist uh, for the own ship, but mm -hmm. also for the ship that will be involved in the uh, STS operation. And of course, uh, such a checklist involves several sections. It's a section uh, with the information of the loading port. It's the information about the cargo. Uh, it's the information about the uh, various entities, shippers, charterers, consignees, everybody, port agents that are involved in all these transactions. So once we receive the information, and in a number of occasions this information is not complete, we start the checks but then we have to go back and ask for the missing information to be provided. On the, on the STS ships, the obligations that are put on underwriters, but also on, uh, on us uh, by OFAC, because OFAC issued their guidelines in May 2020, and they are very detailed. Uh, when we have STS, we need to check the, the other ship uh, and go back as far as two years, if possible. This is time consuming and it's also expensive if you do not have the available software to do the checks. Mm -hmm. So all these delays create also a friction between us and our clients because they're anxious to go and uh, complete their operation. In a particular scenario, we have the borderline cases as we call them, where we see something in the software we use for sanctions checks and that means we have to obtain external legal advice, not just from the UK, but also from the US perspective. Mm -hmm. This will delay things even more. So um, if we see something that um, is questionable, uh, we have to put clients on notice because uh, if we find ourselves in a situation where one of these ships could be sanctioned, the STA ship, for example, then we have to drop the management as well. In a particular case, we, we were in disagreement with our underwriters. They could see that a ship is sanctioned. We could see that possibly it is not. And that's where things get a bit sour, actually. Um, you put clients on notice preliminary, but you have to persuade the underwriters that this ship is not sanctioned. And this proves that all these uh, um, databases that we all use are not automatically updated. We managed to find out objective evidence which the underwriters could, have, could accept that the ships that they believed were sanctioned had already been sold to non-sanctioned mm -hmm. uh, entities and therefore the operation was not considered by us mm -hmm. sanctionable. They made, it took another day or so for them to make the checks and they confirmed and gave the green light at the end of the day for mm -hmm. the operation mm -hmm. to go ahead. Should we have followed, in the majority of instances we are of course following uh, uh, what our underwriters are saying and cancel the agreement, that would have put everyone from the owner's side or from the manager side, actually, um, on a very difficult situation because we would have a battle to, to gain uh, by us being sued by the client. These are if, very... If just, uh, yes, of course. Uh, make yeah, a, please make an addition as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I had an incident before the, uh, the price cap uh, came through at the start of the year, um, and this is in the latter part of uh, last year, with a member who wanted to uh, lift an oil cargo from uh, the northern part of Russia. Um, and, uh, you know, theoretically, all may be fine. And they, uh, they sent a message across to me saying, uh, you know, the, war, the, uh, the hull insurers have said it's all fine. And, uh, and this is where the devil is in the detail, mm -hmm. um, because it wasn't fine. Um, 
the member had only recently bought the vessel, and it was after the cut-off date uh, for when insurance had to have been in place. And if you went through the FAQs and looked at the detail of the EU uh, regulations, yeah, this was not a voyage that could uh, actually take place without it being a falling foul of the EU sanctions. So you know, the devil is in the detail, and people are quite keen in the process of doing their due diligence to dash straight to looking at the SDN lists and seeing, you know, investigating companies and who's got the, you know, the, the shareholders in entities and the waterfall effect yeah. of these types of things. Um, you know, so really do make sure you actually understand the legislation before you even start. And, uh, and there was a little bit of a conflict. But uh, Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Yeah. And um, it is clear that an additional uh, element of uncertainty is uh, brought into the context where shipping business is called upon to operate. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, the shipping business is not, uh, uh, this is not the first time that um, we have such factors, but nevertheless, the thing with sanctions is that they are, um, uh, they have, um, we have different regimes, uh, UN, US, EU, Australia, we have so different jurisdictions, and the activity of the ship being uh, global uh, there are more chances to come across uh, these uh, uh, nets where um, sanctions due diligence must be exercised uh, and this aspect has to be in good order. The drastic consequences of sanctions uh, surprise many professionals, believe me. I mean, the marine insurance sector is familiar, of course, but uh, if you go a little bit further, you will realize uh, that there are professional groups that need to enhance their, enhance their awareness over sanctions. Uh, Ian, let me ask you about the interaction of uh, uh, claims handling and the banking sector. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult uh, situation. You, we may, as, a, as an insurer, be uh, wanting to pay a claim uh, in, for example, it may be to a Russian entity. Um, then uh, you've gone through all of the checks and uh, everything is clean and clear. There are no uh, SDN-related issues. But the difficulties are, you know, you need to make a, a bank transfer in whatever currency, and uh, the bank's don't have a similar appetite uh, because they are incredibly risk averse. Uh, they do have their own procedures. It may be you need to apply for specific licenses to be able to do certain activities. So uh, it, uh, it's not for the lack of trying or the will to try and uh, assist members in certain circumstances, but occasionally the banking system in particular may be, uh, have a, a different perspective and uh, it can be quite difficult to try and persuade them otherwise. Mm -hmm. And um, Andreas, have you uh, seen any impacts on the human factor out of this uh, story? Definitely, and uh, it's, uh, it's a war, so uh, people are affected on both sides, uh, and not only. Um, we have not faced any incidents. We, we, we employ mixed crew on board our ships. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not faced any particular incidents, serious incidents uh, amongst the crew and the company's uh, policies not to discuss the war whilst at work, be it in the office or on board the ships. Again, I'll demonstrate though how uh, difficult it is to deal with, uh, especially uh, people that cannot be repatriated home um, because that's where the difficulties arise. From the insurance perspective, though, I will not uh, deal with the contractual sites, uh, although I have to mention that it has been internationally accepted and agreed amongst mm -hmm. employers, unions, and other bodies that uh, Ukrainian seafarers could be considered as repatriated in a country of their choice, preferably neighboring countries to Ukraine, but it could be other countries where they may have family. Now, if you have um, uh, an injured seafarer that comes from Ukraine, of course, you will uh, treat the seafarer at the point of disembarkation, but at some point, that seafarer has to be returning home. Mm -hmm. um, it's his choice, but if you have a seriously injured person, he needs to go to a place where he can be rehabilitated. So. This, of course, a covered situation by p and clubs. So the seafarer is choosing a country where there are specialized hospitals, he had burns, and after the seafarer uh, uh, 
is a sign of the hospital. He has to find somewhere to stay because there is a continuation to mm -hmm, his mm -hmm. rehabilitation. That's where the problems arise because he's not in his home country. He doesn't have a house. And of course, the club considers the contract as finished. The club will continue paying for sick wages, hospital expenses, for further surgeries, any other uh, physiotherapy or whatever, but not for housing and lodging. Mm. That's where the humanitarian aspect comes in. It's left with the manager, employer, owner to deal with this person on a humanitarian aspect. Uh, will he go and declare himself as a refugee so he assumes that status? So it's all these questions that uh, uh, mm -hmm. bother us. Uh, Another aspect is a death of a seafarer of Ukrainian um, nationality. Where do you uh, return the body? Uh, th that has been a huge headache and problem, mostly for the family. For us, we would have found a solution. But they wanted to bury their person, and we could not. We couldn't uh, re literally repatriate the body, so uh, we had to to obtain the consent of the widow to cremate the body, mm -hmm. despite religiously this was not acceptable. But it was the only way that we could repatriate something back. Not to Ukraine, we had to fly um, the body to a country where cremation could be done. And then the family had to travel and obtain the ashes and transport them back in whatever means to Ukraine. The story doesn't finish. You know, the, the family will create uh, a legal case now. I mean, that's usual. Uh, not usual, but uh, it, there is a continuation to it because, of course, they say that we could have treated the person better. The club has gone and us beyond what normally we mm -hmm. would have done in such cases. But still, we, we will face now a legal yeah. case somewhere. Mm -hmm. About 14% of worldwide uh, maritime labor comes from uh, Russian Federation and Ukraine. And the other point is that there has been an amendment on deceased uh, seafarers uh, in June 2022 in the context of uh, MLC. It is an MLC amendment expected to enter into force alongside other amendments mm -hmm. by December 2024. Uh, would you like to comment on the human, on seafarers and PNI cover in the context of uh, that we are discussing, Ian? Or yeah, sure. I, mean, I think I can. Uh, I can also supplement uh, something that Andreas had just mentioned, and uh, and this may actually feed into uh, Fred's uh, work as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I was asked the other day. Uh, um, you know, can we take our vessel to low grain in Odessa, and what are the potential risks and issues that could arise out of that? And of course, you know, provided you've got all the right insurances in place, you know, that's, you're effectively good to go, and be incredibly careful about what you're doing. Um, but the the question then is, well, what happens if one of our crew members is taken ill or has an injury when they are actually in, in Ukraine. And, uh, and of course, it's, it's very difficult to answer the question because we are not as familiar with, uh, other than through our correspondents who are fantastic in advising, um, about what the facilities are mm -hmm. because obviously you would have expected that a country that's in the middle of a war is going to have a, an increased pressure upon its own health services. Um, but uh, we were assured that you know, we would be able to uh, you know, get health service um, for for somebody if we needed it. But of course, repatriation of somebody uh, if they were seriously ill to a not Ukrainian national crew to bring them back home you know, to the Philippines or wherever it may be, may be rather difficult to do. Um, mm -hmm. So you, know, you had to go into these things very much with your eyes open. And of course, if somebody is injured on the basis you know, that they were hit by a stray bullet or shrapnel, something like that, that's going to move across into the war risk P&I aspect as opposed to the vanilla P&I which we would deal with. So you know, there's a whole interaction between each of the, the types of policies. And it really is uh, the, the way that the P&I club rules are drawn are very much that the the uh, you know where PNI ends and war risk PNI starts really does dovetail, so that hopefully there is sufficient protection and assistance for uh, you know particularly the crews uh, who are uh, involved mm -hmm. in these circumstances. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, the word um, interaction is a is a takeaway mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. from today's uh, 
session. Yes, please. Yeah, address. there is an additional aspect, and this is where do you pay the compensations? Mm -hmm. uh, with Ukrainians, we don't have so much problem uh, unless they reside in, in the occupied areas uh, of Lugansk or Donetsk or Crimea. But when it comes to Russian seafarers being injured or uh, uh, ill, uh, they can be repatriated at home. But then the issue of sanctions comes in on where they have their bank accounts and how yeah. much money you can remit into those bank accounts. Um, we heard yesterday or the day before at the CSC that uh, in Cyprus, uh, uh, seafarers of these nationalists come and open bank accounts at the Cypriot banks. Some of them have taken this uh, on board, some not. Uh, they may provide bank accounts in Georgia, for example. We can find ways out, but still we had cases where uh, funds have been blocked. If uh, the CIFAR gives us a bank account in a Russian bank, which is not sanctioned, but we had faced issues within a day to remit, to remit funds mm. to uh, the same bank for two separate CIFARs, and because by the time we send the funds, the bank has been sanctioned, yeah, the funds is, are blocked. Yeah. And again, uh, mm -hmm. even if they are insurance-related funds, they are still blocked by the US. Yeah, the volatile funds. nature yeah. of uh, everything mm -hmm. changes, and mm -hmm. an entity may, be, may not be sanctioned today, it may become sanctioned uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And since we are talking about the human uh, aspects, I think it is fair, Fred, to go back to your presentation where you had uh, mentioned the problem of unjust criminal criminalization of severs at some uh, stage, mm -hmm. right? And um, is there uh, anything that you would like uh, to comment on from your perspective uh, on compliance and uh, sanctions, which is the focus of this panel, the reaction, uh, the, 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 the response of the industry to sanctions? Um, is there anything else that you would like to share with us before uh, I go to the last question and uh, share the takeaways uh, with the audience? Well, I, I, go for lunch. <laughs> well, I, I just one thing that that hasn't been touched on um, that that certainly has insurance implications that the IMO and the ILO uh, are working very hard on is the issue of abandonment and um, the tremendous spike in abandonment cases that has occurred really since the beginning of the pandemic, but continues. But if you look prior to the um, the 2014 amendments to the MLC, which required abandonment insurance and, and for P&I to provide that cover, uh, which went into effect in January of 2017, we were getting between 12 and 15 cases a year reported mm -hmm. to the joint ILO-IMO database. After the uh, requirements went into effect, that jumped up to a, between 40 and 50 per year. Um, which was probably as a result of better reporting. Uh, but since the pandemic in 2020, uh, we had 84 reported cases. In 2021, we had 93 reported cases. And in 2022, we had 109. And these cases really are human tragedies. So uh, the, the effect of abandonment on the seafarers uh, and what we're discovering is in about 60% of the cases, there is no cover. Um, the, uh, the, the ship owner has either uh, not provided cover or let it lapse. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so to try to resolve some of these cases more effectively, the IMO has, and the ILO uh, recently adopted guidelines for flag states, port states, and seafarer supplying states uh, to, to provide practical advice on how to resolve them more quickly. I think the biggest issues has been in the port states where they may not be familiar. Uh, seafarers need access to legal counsel so that they can place a lien on the ship for their wages. That's one of the biggest issues is getting them their wages if there is no cover. Uh, getting them repatriated is a little easier, but a lot of times the seafarers don't want to leave if they're, if they're leaving without their wages. So, you know, getting the lien placed and forcing a judicial sale of the ship so that the, the seafarers can be con compensated is really, it's a growing issue and it's something that I think the entire industry needs to grapple with. 
Thank you, Fred. And from uh, seafarers and uh, relevant uh, marine insurance uh, risks to oil price cap. This is uh, the last uh, question for, uh, uh, from us, and then we will receive questions from the audience. Uh, Ian, could you please uh, um, elaborate on oil okay. price cap, uh, the implications, the logistics, the problems with other stations? Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, there is room for uh, clarifications, I think, and uh, sharing uh, knowledge uh, with the audience and experiences. Yes, I mean, you know, this is a, a, a growing potential issue, and um, you know, the, uh, the the obligations to uh, receive the oil price uh, attestations are uh, really quite stringent, and uh, and, and those attestations really do need to you know then get registered etc cetera, etc cetera. so there are some logistical implications for it but the uh, I think the, the biggest issue really has started to arise uh, for when cargoes are being taken by STS um, uh, from you know they've come from a Russian port they've gone to uh, to, to an STS location um, and uh, and then th th they're perhaps being loaded on one of our members vessels by STS and then going off to outside of the EU perhaps over to India or China and uh, yeah, the obligations that are on the uh, the ship owner who's receiving that cargo are, are to uh, ask about the uh, the price cap get the station certifications in place and the difficulty is you know, is it always going to be correct and, uh, and you know our advice is can only be if you do think there's any issue with it you know you really do have to probe further make those inquiries and and it's also very important to remember that the uh, the price cap applies from the date that the cargo is loaded uh, from somewhere in Russia through the SDS and until it passes clears customs at the discharge port. So there's a long period of obligation that mm -hmm. uh, that has to be addressed in that. And we just issued a notice to our members uh, on all of these issues because it is quite nebulous. It's not straightforward. Uh, do you think? Thank you, Jan. Do you think that the loss prevention uh, departments of PNI clubs have adequately addressed uh, the challenge of enhancing awareness over um, oil price cap, the logistics, the attestations, compliance? Because uh, this is very demanding, after that's all. That's not something that really falls within the remit of loss prevention. It's more on the compliance side, and, okay. uh, and then perhaps looking at you know contractual implications with. Uh, with charters and other parties who are going to be involved in that maritime adventure. You know, the loss prevention people will probably be more focused on, uh, you know, how you do an SDS safely and, uh, mm -hmm. and make sure that, you know, there are no problems um, from a more physical perspective, whereas this is about the contractual links. And that, that links through into our underwriting people, IT, because the attestations all have to be recorded, you know, calls in Russia. You know, we've all got, uh, all the clubs have got separate uh, email addresses where these things are collated. So there's there's a lot of information has to go in the background to be able to put that in place. Mm -hmm. In any case, whether PNI clubs uh, address adequately the enhancement of awareness. Uh, yeah, I, would, I think we all do. I mean, uh, you'll Good. see that the mm -hmm. notice to members that we've put out, you know, there's a, a very common notice has gone out by all of the clubs. And that's where the international group has its great strength uh, in that it's able to uh, uh, collate that type of information, come up with a, a best practice guideline. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and some, some people, you know, for instance, like Mike Salthouse from mm -hmm. North Standard, who works on the, uh, chairs the international group sub um, subcommittee on sanctions, does an absolutely fantastic job um, and, uh, and you know, engages with the relevant parties uh, to try and uh, put forward the voice of the ship owners mm -hmm. because we are a, a strong voice but one that's sometimes uh, not heard as loudly as perhaps we would like it to and he does a fantastic job of pushing that forwards. I have no doubt about that. We may have questions about uh, oil price cap mm -hmm. in which case we may return to your expertise. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's uh, time to see whether we have any questions from the audience and uh, give the chance to our panelists to share additional views with you. Please do take advantage of this opportunity to ask uh, the panelists. I think there was a question related to piracy from earlier, which was going to be addressed through that to us. That would be nice to uh -huh. hear the question again and perhaps have additional questions if possible. A 
Okay. Well, actually, it's, um, uh, it's a question on piracy indeed, but also on, uh, um, on an additional one, if I can add to it, in terms of not just piracy, but maybe other issues that perhaps the industry is kind of putting in the back burner because we're all focused on the war, so maybe you want to add on to that afterwards. The actual question is, with piracy figures going down, many countries started pulling their warships defending merchant vessels from attacks. Will this result in a new increase in piracy? Are insurers and ship owners prepared for such a case? So that was, that was the actual question. Of course, you know, are we just too focused maybe on the war and the sanctions and other things that are happening in the background? Question to anyone who wants to answer. Who would like to address the question from the aspect which is uh, near to your field? Well, I, I think that um, you know the part of the question that says with pirate attacks decreasing and, and naval units being pulled away, I, that's certainly true um, in East Africa. Uh, there has only been one successful pirate attack, I think, in the last eight years now. Uh, off the coast of Somalia. The Gulf of Guinea is a, a different situation where there was a significant increase. There were naval units brought in and then it dropped off. It dropped off to nearly nothing until just very recently and now there have been three kidnappings uh, just in the last month so the numbers are rising again uh, in that area. And then when you look at the Straits of Malacca uh, and the figures there, they always tend to be cyclical. They, they go up and they go down. So, um, uh, you know, the response, I think, is going to be measured by the number of incidents. And, and certainly in the Gulf of Guinea, there have been some concerning incidents of late. Mm -hmm. I think you also you look at some of the, uh, the root causes of uh, piracy as well, particularly from the East African situation. It was partly driven by uh, instability. Uh, and if you have increased uh, political stability, uh, yeah, that gives people the opportunity to then go back to doing what they wanted to do, which was fishing, etc. Um, so, uh, you know, the appetite for actually doing something which is incredibly dangerous, being a pirate, is a dangerous thing to do. Um, you know, the, the loss of life for those people in small skiffs out in the open ocean is, uh, you know, quite remarkable. So, you know, if you can fix some of the, the land-based issues, that may actually have an impact. Um, and how that, of course, impacts in, you know, the, uh, within uh, West Africa and the Gulf of Guinea, you know, the drivers there are very different from the ones that are over on the, uh, on the, the you know, the east of uh, Africa, and again, very different from those in the Straits of Malacca, which are basically just robbers. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the nature of things in piracy, which is a rather a broad umbrella term, you know, does have a lot of different drivers, and trying to address those, you know, is very uh, nation and, uh, and uh, area specific, I think. And Thank owners, you managers yes. usually take the, the measures that are suggested by the industry yeah. when going through these areas. These will not be relaxed mm -hmm. as long as there is some sort of risk. This is a part of risk assessment that, uh, mm -hmm. and we have to follow what the industry suggests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have a considerable industry best practice uh, mm -hmm. over piracy. Mm -hmm. um, any more questions? Uh, yes, please. Uh, Sophocles from... Cyprus Shipping Thank Chamber. Thank you. Uh, Sophocles yes. Costandino, Cyprus Shipping Chamber. My question to Andreas and Ian. Uh, in our first session in the morning, we uh, uh, referred to uh, the preparedness of the industry, the ability of the industry to be prepared. And it so happens that uh, two nights ago, I was watching a Netflix series, The Diplomat, where there is a very interesting quote, and I quote, we have sanctioned Russian debt, we have embarked on their oil, we have banned Russia from SWIFT. What is the next move, and what else is there to be sanctioned? Do we as industry have the ability, after all that has happened, to actually predict what would be the next move? Thank you. Um, actually, Sophocles is a question that has to be answered by the politicians rather than uh -huh. by practitioners. Uh, we don't have the crystal ball in our hands. 
And I don't know if the question should have been addressed to him more, more than to a manager <laughs> or a p and club. And I haven't watched The Diplomat, by the way, either. Um, it's difficult to say what else can be done. And uh, it's also very difficult to say that all what is happening in terms of sanctions has really have any effect. Um, and whether uh, we heard it in, in the morning, there are operators that uh, will bypass or try to bypass sanctions in any case. It's just that us as prudent managers, operators need to be vigilant and uh, take all these measures to, to avoid having to collaborate with these entities. Fred, I sense uh, an appetite for addressing uh, the question. Or well, as an, international I uh, as an international civil servant, I have no uh, appetite for addressing the political implications. <laughs> part, of the, part of the question. Because anything I say would certainly get me into trouble. So, But uh, looking at, at the rise of the, of the so-called dark fleet, uh, the IMO has been looking at that. It was addressed at the legal committee in March. Mm -hmm. uh, but... And, and when you look exactly. at the insurance implications of the dark fleet, I think it was uh, the description of the motor tanker Plato incident. I mean, that, that brings it right home because that vessel was not insured. Uh, and so it, it is going to uh, become the responsibility of the coastal state if there is a spill uh, or deaths as, or, or we have missing personnel. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, who is going to be responsible if there is no insurance? And from the IMO perspective, uh, the thought that we have large tankers out there um, either fraudulently registered uh, or uh, claiming a registration that they don't have because we've seen a number of tankers claiming, for example, Marshall Islands, U.S., Liberian registry when they actually aren't registered there. So one can only assume that all of their certificates are fake as well. Um, it completely undermines the IMO regulatory regime and uh, that ensures that ships will s operate safely, securely, and, um, and uh, envir in an environmentally friendly manner. So mm -hmm. this is really something that the, the world community needs to get a, a grip on. Uh, there was, I, I think, uh, there was a very um, intense debate about this at the, at the legal committee um, uh, and, the, and the implications of, of sanctions uh, with respect to the rise of the dark fleet. And I think that's going to continue at the Maritime Safety Committee coming up at the end of this month. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions, please? Uh, Anna? Again, it's just a, a bit of a, a challenging devil's advocate kind of question in terms of dark fleet uh, situations or non-dark fleets, uh, vessels that are not sort of like going in the dark, but do opt to not buy additional war coverage. Now, obviously, um, either because of the cost or because of circumstances or because the charter has refused to pay it, etc. Um, it is a scenario that is becoming tempting. Um, owners do not, I think it was Ian that, that raised it, I'm not quite sure who raised it, that owners do not necessarily understand the difference and where each part of the cover falls, i.e. where the basic war cover stops and where the, the additional war cover um, starts or where the crew liabilities um, rest whether they fall under the war cover or the PNI cover. But in those circumstances where owners are tempted to say, oh, I'm going to self-insure for the additional war. Well, they say, I'm going to self-insure, but they are thinking about their property and or maybe the cargo, etc. But what about the human lives on that vessel that is either dark or the owner chooses not to insure for war risks, should perhaps, or even at least for the corridor where we have some control of circumstances where the circumstances are dictated for which ships are allowed to use a corridor, um, you are sending your, your crew, your ship into a war area, 
um, don't you have a contractual responsibility, at least if ethically you don't have one, uh, to protect those crew members from whatever circumstance that may, um, circumstances may arise? How would you think the possibility of, say, imposing a war cover, at least for the crew members? Who would like to add this? I, I this, think uh, that again or delves into, the, into the realms of politics, which you know we really can't sort of uh, you know, get into. Um, and, uh, yeah, you can see Only, the, the, well, that's the to the Fred. extent that yeah. you are allowed to and you yeah. feel comfortable, yeah. If, yeah. Um, yeah. Or, or selected aspects of the question. It's on, just a on, brainstorming on the, on, yeah, thing I mean, you, in terms you can see of the moral obligations. Uh, human lives, yeah. you know? Yeah. On, on the manager's okay. side, it's, mm -hmm. it's simpler. The, the, the answer is that the owner for whom we manage a ship is obligated under the management agreement to buy this insurance. Mm -hmm. If they don't, that means breach of management agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, there is also stipulation in the collective bargaining agreements. Of course, if you have such an operator, possibly they don't abide by any bargaining agreement. But within the, the terms of a bargaining agreement, the, the seafarers are well protected. Uh, so if, if their employer owner, uh, if I exclude the managers, doesn't buy insurance for them, they, okay, they have to shout, it's very difficult, but uh, they have also the chance to step out at the port prior to the commencement of the voyage. Assuming they are given the information, assuming that they, they are covered have or they're not covered. Uh, the it was just a thing because it, it, it is in the same way that we have dark fleets. We also have substandard owners that, mm -hmm. you know, will take the shortcut kind of thing. Thank you, Anna. A any more questions? Uh, uh, we have time constraints, but um, if we have interesting uh, points, one one point to make, uh, just yes. not to forget it. And it goes possibly to, to Fred, but also Cyprus Shipping Chamber. Somehow I don't look like this. <laughs> it's the initiative we started uh, at Intertanko uh, on standardizing the um, sanctions checklists. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether people in this room or elsewhere want to take this up, but we had this initiative and we called Q88, being a, a company that standardizes uh, lists in, in the industry uh, in the attempt to avoid all this administration work that falls on each and every one of us. So uh, I, I hope that people will take it on board. Intertank, of course, deals just with tankers. You need separate lists for each type of vessel. Not each type, but you need separate lists for container ships because it's simpler and the burden is not so big. But uh, yeah. Uh, that I just wanted to put this yeah, on. Yeah, this is a, an interesting highlight. Thank you for sharing. So, uh, also in light of uh, our time constraints, let me attempt to share the takeaways of uh, today's uh, conference, uh, summarize, and uh, bring the uh, conference to an end. So, allow me to uh, go to come here for this uh, last uh, uh, task. I think that uh, it is easier to um, present the takeaways in the form of keywords rather than in the form of statements. And some of uh, the most interesting keywords that come to my mind as a result of today's uh, activities are the following. Uh, resilience, uncertainty, sanctions, mm, Unknown factors, everything which can be perceived as disruptive in um, shipping business. Nevertheless, in, in the first session, we have also uh, uh, come across additional areas, uh, priority areas, uh, which refer to specific uh, items like ESG, decarbonization, um, so, uh, navigation, uh, ocean sh shipping in the, in the Arctic, uh, and other uh, challenges, um, cyber threats, uh, security. I think uh, this is clearly uh, an industry which knows how to survive and make projections with confidence towards uh, the future. 
And um, I understand also that against uh, this somewhat fluid background, you may wish to leave this room with uh, concrete takeaways. From my perspective, I think I see at least uh, two uh, tangible uh, points. The first one is uh, enhancement of awareness. The second one is um, the contact of uh, sanctions uh, due diligence uh, checks and uh, ensuring regulatory compliance uh, so that things are in good order. All in all, I hope uh, today's conference has given food for thought in a very challenging context, and I have no doubt that each and every one of you will uh, elaborate on these uh, priority areas so as to uh, enhance and protect your interests. Thank you, uh, Adonis Violaris and Anna Vulgos and all for this uh, a, a wonderful opportunity uh, to uh, meet here uh, in Limassol and wishing uh, successful undertakings with good health, as we say in Greek, to all. Thank you very much. <laughs>